Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, again here in Silicon Valley, Cloud Expo, fourth and final day, seventh Cloud Expo, who'd have thunk it? Cisco are here to join us. Absent friends, I could almost say. Great to have you aboard. Simon Aspel is going to give us a catch-up. If you think that there's been a British takeover of the cloud, there has. Let's give it up, please, for Simon Aspinall. Thanks very much. So, thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, as you can tell from the accent, I am another of these British imports. I look after marketing for our data center cloud and mo mobile businesses. So, over the next... 29 minutes or so, I'm going to give you a quick insight into what we see happening in the cloud, why we think it's going to be ultimately critically important for enterprises, small medium businesses, and service providers in the telco sector. And I'll give you a little insight into what's driving those changes and what some of the opportunities are. So first of all, we now recognize, as an industry, as a set of companies, as a set of businesses, that cloud really is the ultimate destination. A lot of today's data, applications, media, and content, in the future, are going to be delivered from the cloud. And it's going to be delivered on demand, literally on any device, at any time. And the power that the cloud brings is extremely impactful. The fact that whether you're a business or you're a consumer, you can combine applications, data, media, and actually drive interactions between the other people connected to the cloud and yourself can really change the dynamic of IT services, video, multimedia, data, applications, productivity, communications, collaboration. Cloud, being a marketing guy, cloud is uh, probably the hottest marketing buzzword currently out there. And it means a, something a little bit different to every person, which if you're a marketing guy is kind of useful. But uh, actually when you're trying to talk about things, it makes it a little bit difficult. So let me give you just a very high level definition in terms of what I'm talking about when I say cloud. And let me say a quick thank you out to my collaboration tools <laughs> and the software providers that haven't quite figured out that context, presence, and awareness are actually important to writing applications. So, first of all, cloud, the ability to deliver data applications, content, or media dynamically on demand to an end device, literally at scale, highly dynamically, probably multi-tenant, so sharing physical assets, sharing virtual assets across multiple users and uh, uses at the same time. And the ability to do that literally on demand is probably the powerful definition of cloud. I know that we have lots of cloud practitioners in the audience, and uh, we could go into infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, and some definitions. But I think ultimately, how the user experiences it is probably the most important way of looking at the cloud. A better way of doing what they're doing today, and a better way of doing new businesses and business models that they haven't previously been able to do any other way. And what's sitting underneath that cloud, what's making that cloud operate well and actually deliver that experience? Really, it's a combination of virtualized compute, virtualized storage, and virtualized networking, all integrated together. In the early days of cloud, cloud was cloud computing, the ability to have a virtual machine or to have some storage sitting up in the cloud. But really now, cloud is more about an experience. And really, if you're going to deliver an application, media, content, or an experience to somebody, you can only do that when you integrate the compute, the storage, and the network and the connection together to make that an achievable experience. So that on-demand, at-scale, multi-tenant delivery is the ultimate endpoint for, fundamentally, we believe, almost every service and application and experience today. Whether you are an enterprise who are traditionally running your own IT, your own data center, your own experience, you'll probably evolve to a private cloud model. If you're a telecoms operator currently running a network and delivering content, you will evolve to a public cloud providing services to multiple users simultaneously. And if you're a consumer, 
and actually most of us consumers to begin with, you're probably already consuming cloud services. You just don't happen to recognize that they're cloud services. And then interestingly, as you step forwards, these individual clouds, private clouds, public clouds, will increasingly be able to talk and interact with each other. You'll see hybrid clouds, the ability to move content from one place to another and back again. And I'll talk a little about some of those use cases and examples. So cloud services is definitely the way we're going. And I'll come back and I'll give you a compelling economic reason as to why that is, as well as the experience reason. So let's talk about how this is changing businesses and the way businesses operate today. It's really impacting three different parts of the value chain. First of all, the service providers, the telco guys, the people who make the networks and connect things together. Secondly, businesses using cloud services. And thirdly, for the individual consumers of those cloud services. First of all, let's talk about those service providers. Uh, the AT&Ts, the Verizons, the Comcast, the Time Warner Cables, the Savices, the Terramarks of this world. Cloud is a phenomenal opportunity for these businesses. First of all, it enables a much more effective and efficient way of delivering the services they provide today. Secondly, it provides a much more dynamic way of delivering those services. And thirdly, it opens up a whole set of new businesses that they previously wouldn't have been able to provide to their end customer servers, server, uh, end customers. So, first of all, for those service providers, all the things that they traditionally deliver out of the network, the connection they make to the internet, all of this can be made much more effective and much more efficient through the use of cloud services. And we're seeing a fundamental change now in the service provider industry. Service providers already traditionally had data centers and ran them for their own IT purposes or call centers or for internal purposes. But now, really, that business model is flipping around, and the service providers are using that data center to deliver services to their end customers, the enterprises, the small, medium businesses, the consumers. And when you think about what cloud can mean, in the old world, you would have a data center, servers, some applications on those servers, maybe a bit of video distribution or content delivery. Once you virtualize the cloud, once you make it very dynamic, once you take all those individual elements and make them virtualized applications and services, suddenly you can dynamically change how you use that data center, how you use that network to deliver those services. Being a Brit, I follow soccer. So when I happen to want to go and watch the World Cup, which happens two weeks every couple of years or so, suddenly for those two weeks, everywhere outside the US just wants to watch soccer, download content, read about it, talk about it with their friends. If you're a service provider, you can allocate a large proportion of your capacity, your cloud, to delivering video content, information, experience, social network, or media around that experience. And then when the World Cup finishes two weeks later, turn it off, flip that data center back, put that cloud back up there, and provide enterprise or small, medium business, voice or communication applications out of the same space. Very powerful model. Most people here are probably working for large enterprises or medium-sized enterprises. Let's talk about some of the implications for the large enterprises. Enterprises today traditionally run data centers, IT, and they're very good at delivering applications and services to their employees. They're also getting reasonably good at connecting those services up to people outside the office, whether it's through iPhones, Blackberries, dongles attached to PCs. The ability for an enterprise to virtualize their data center, which, by the way, brings your economic efficiency from about 20% up to about 80%, but then the really dynamic ability to provide a literal on-demand interface to those services. So instead of I come up with a new application, I call up my IT department, I say I want to run this application for the guys in my marketing group, they go off, they buy a server, they buy some licenses, they buy the software, they install the servers, they then wire them up, hook them up to the network, they then put the application, the servers up on there, they configure it, they configure the network policies, the security policies, and 
three months later, I get access to my application. Suddenly, you can put that software image, that virtual image, up into the cloud. You can provide a menu to me as a user within the enterprise, and I can go in and select that application or that content to select and identify that I want 250 seats, and that virtual image can be brought up, brought into the data center, literally configured service, security, policy, network connectivity on demand. And suddenly I go from months to implement a new service to literally minutes. <clears throat> Let me give you a real example. Uh, working with one of, um, I'll pick another European example, working with one of the European retail banks, they have had voice over IP communications collaboration provided by Cisco and traditionally, that voice over IP communications and collaboration solution required approximately 25 servers, about 25 ser software applications, licenses, configuration, and this was to support about 30,000 people. Voice over IP phones, communication, collaboration, email, integration. Now, about two months ago, we launched the virtualized version of this called Hosted Collaboration Solution. HCS runs in a fully virtualized data center as a single set of images. That 25 server site now runs in two virtualized servers. It'll support between 250 employees and about 125,000 employees. And you can literally turn on, turn off new seats, new people, new capabilities using an on-demand web services interface. And you can see the kind of dynamic that that can change for how quickly you can bring up services and deliver them. Second place this is really changing is the public sector, whether federal, local, state, government. Suddenly the opportunity to take all of these individual citizen experiences services, police, fire, security, benefits, and to pull them up into the cloud and deliver them out of the cloud gives you a lot more flexibility to be able to suddenly provide a real scalable service. And instead of each individual state or government agency having its own website, its own data center, its own applications, its own services, you can bring together and actually combine all of those services and deliver them out of a single integrated virtualized cloud infrastructure. One of the European countries, who I'm not allowed to name for technical purposes, but you might be able to guess which one, has about 70 million people in the country. It has something like 390 government agencies. Those 390 government agencies all traditionally had their own data centers, their own IT, their own applications, their own IT support, their own outward-facing experience. And as a citizen of that country, I'd have to go off to the revenue site or the taxation site or the parking site or the health site or the XXX site. Actually underway now is a very major project to bring all of those agencies onto a common cloud-based infrastructure to integrate all of those services and provide them through common interfaces as web services to the end citizen consumer. And boy, trust me, as a citizen, I'm on some of the experimental stuff, the experience is so much better. Being able to get stuff done actually when I want to do it, as opposed to between 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock on a Monday to Thursday, if I'm lucky, and the right guy is on the phone. The experience change is fundamental. And interestingly, it costs a lot less to deliver the same service much more effectively. The third big space that I think people underestimate in the cloud space is the relevance of cloud services and what it can mean for small-medium businesses. Small-medium businesses traditionally don't have IT departments. They don't run their own data centers. They probably go off to Best Buy and buy a couple of bits of IT equipment and plug them together and run them. But suddenly, if you're a service provider, for example, and you have data centers fully virtualized providing cloud services, you can offer the same enterprise-grade IT and cloud services to the small, medium business as you do to the large enterprise. Suddenly, he doesn't need the own, his own IT site. Suddenly, he doesn't need all of this support. 
suddenly he can get all of these cloud services and actually he can compete very effectively with much larger businesses and he can burn a lot less time on the half technical guy in his company who ends up solving all of the problems that go alongside configuring, running and executing this model. So I think small medium business is a great untapped audience for the cloud space. And consumers. I think most of us are probably most familiar with this space. On the consumer side, we're already experiencing cloud services. And the way that it changes our interaction with applications, our interaction with data, but really the relevance it can bring. I always hesitate to use Google as an example, but Google Maps for me is a very interesting illustration of the power of cloud computing and what it can bring to change an experience. For the folks who aren't familiar, Google Maps provides maps, directions, how to navigate from A to B. And you can do that as an application on a PC, you can do that as a device in your car. But the fact that that end cloud endpoint, that mobile phone, that happens to be running that application, is providing information about my location back up to the cloud. The fact the cloud is combining all of that information from all of those connections and can use that information to actually infer, really, why the 237 is traveling at three miles an hour and actually overlay that information real-time, live, onto that cloud map actually provides me a lot more value than the same application held locally would ever be able to do. And I use that just as a simple illustration of how cloud services are actually cloud plus above the traditional application and service space. Similarly, I talked about that communication collaboration experience, the ability to combine lots of different applications and services together into a single integrated package and provide it really virtually on demand is a very powerful model. So watching my time. We have to recognize the challenges around cloud today. Talking to enterprises, small, medium businesses, everybody's barriers to cloud are very, very similar. Everybody says, is it secure? Can I trust it? Am I going to go to jail for moving my information out of the country into another country? Is it reliable? I can put this stuff up in the cloud. Can I get it back out again? And what's my experience going to be like? And it was very interesting to see. Cloud services took off very rapidly. But cloud services today are often offering a best efforts model. Put it up there, but I'm not going to guarantee it's going to work. I'm not going to guarantee you've got access to it. I'm not going to guarantee your experience is great. The big evolution you're going to see over the next 6 to 12 months are cloud services guaranteeing that experience. If you're a service provider or a telco, you can guarantee how it feels, what the latency, the application, the availability, the experience is on the handset, on the PC, locally. I think that'll be the next big evolution for the cloud space. Suddenly being able to rely and trust that the cloud service is going to work and work well is a very big evolution. And control is the fourth issue people have. It was, um, it's always interesting. I meet with a lot of customers, and a lot of customers and IT guys all tell me, ah, I don't trust the cloud. I'm not going to put stuff up there. We'll let the developers go off and play on that for a bit, but we're not going to put anything real up there. Now, sometimes the IT guys are saying that because they understand that shifting stuff to the cloud may not be the greatest career move for an internal IT guy, ultimately. But interestingly, pulling one of the major banks as an example, cloud can add incredible value to an existing IT operation. The bank I'm thinking about had a couple of data centers and was about to build a third for redundancy purposes. And they were about to scale up those data centers by 100% capacity because of all the fun and games we've had in the financial sector over the last couple of years. They need a lot more processing power, a lot more capability and capacity. Suddenly that bank had a conversation with a service provider and took that third data center from the service provider as opposed to building it themselves. Disaster recovery, resiliency, suddenly didn't need to build out the capacity. 
And then when they looked at the analysis around doubling their own data center capacity, which would involve new buildings, rewire, rebuild, they suddenly discovered that actually there was only one or two applications and uses that were driving this sudden increase in capacity. And most of them were calculations. Once a week, they had to report to the regulator value at risk. That value at risk is a set of highly complex numerical calculations. And actually, they figured out that you can take that calculation, flow it up into somebody else's cloud, let that other cloud do the calculation for you, and bring the results back down again. And actually, you don't need to build for that single peak capacity. They could pretty much keep their existing capacity and just lease cloud capacity or compute power. And because it's a set of calculations, there wasn't concerns on information or compliance or risk of information getting out. So that cloud burst ability to connect an enterprise cloud to another cloud and use it as overrun capacity or disaster recovery or redundancy is a very powerful model, even for existing IT businesses today. So, I've talked about a couple of these already. I just wanted to highlight Cisco and Cisco's role in this. Obviously, Cisco is a traditionally a network supplier to telcos, enterprises, small, medium businesses. A couple of years ago, Cisco made a fundamental strategic investment in the cloud space and actually launched a compute server offer alongside our networking offer. And we signed a couple of very close alliances with a couple of the leading ecosystem players in the cloud and data center spaces. And this was a very conscious strategic decision for the business. We saw the evolution in terms of where we believe IT applications, content, and media are going. And saw this necessity to be able to integrate compute, storage, and network and have them operate as an integrated whole as opposed to separate islands connected together. And that business has been phenomenal for us. We've seen immense uptake of enterprises building private cloud services. We've seen immense uptake of service providers building public cloud services. And we're just seeing a rapid acceleration in terms of what services are being consumed out of the cloud. Many people start today experimenting in the cloud. Let me offer the same service in the cloud as I do traditionally and see what the uptake is like. But very rapidly, as people get a taste for the benefits, suddenly users move across, suddenly the experience changes, and those cloud services take off very rapidly. So the early days of infrastructure as a service, computers as a service, storage as a service, is a good business, and that's growing fast. But actually, the evolution up into communications, collaboration, security, and actually media and video delivery is the next big boundary for how cloud is going to change the economics and change the experience for us. And Cisco provides communication, collaboration, and security services to enterprises and service providers, as well as providing the equipment and actually the services to help you build and implement data centers, virtualized data centers, and cloud delivery platforms. And whether it's bringing together traditionally separate applications. In the communications collaboration space, you have voice over IP, you have IM, you have email, you have presence, you have video conferencing, you have telepresence, you have WebEx, you have Tamburg. All of those elements can be brought together and integrated into a single application. You can bring in social tools. So the enterprise equivalents of Wikipedia, Facebook, and the social interfaces are all being integrated together and are now being provided as single virtualized applications and services delivered out of the cloud. And the power that provides. On the security space, there's a very strong evolution as well. If you happen to have a Cisco network, you'll find that it will now interact with a global security center that can monitor the behaviors of networks across the globe, look at the behaviors of traffic on those networks, and identify new threats, new risks, new denial-of-service attacks, new viruses, from the flows and the behaviors, 
and actually be able to flow out that security information to networks worldwide. So one experience of a problem can suddenly actually apply security solutions to a global coverage model. Again, a very powerful evolution. I'm not going to spend too much time on products or technology, but I think there's some very strong evolution in the virtualization, data center, and the cloud space. It started off with the ability to take what used to be three physical wires, put them together on one wire, and use that one wire for LAN, SAN, management capabilities. So instead of having to re-physically wire your data centers, now you can do that virtually and move around those capacities as required. Secondly, I talked about that ability to combine compute with network. So Cisco's unified computing system, the server platform combined with the networking platform with a single integrated management tool, enabling you to actually configure virtual machines alongside the networking ca- policies and capabilities, enables you to be able to move both the network and the compute and the storage elements around together. True virtualization. So the third step was taking some of the traditional fixed hardware-based switching capabilities and putting them up as software into the virtualized hypervisor layer. So suddenly, with a switch up in the hypervisor within the virtual machine, when you want to move a virtual machine from one place to another, you can move the virtual machine, and actually the IP address, the MAC address, the network security policy can move with it. So you truly can get this dynamic experience moving either from one place to another or moving an image in and out, workload in and out. The fourth evolution was really to take some of the complexity out of the model. We have a set of ecosystem partners. I'll talk about a couple in a minute. We brought together some pre-integrated solutions to the data center space. I use the example of VMware, Cisco, and EMC as one of those alliances. So that VCE alliance has an integrated set of solutions called VBlocks that literally you can pick up, drop down in a data center, and use that as your foundational building block for a private cloud or a foundational building block for a public cloud, taking the complexity out of that network compute storage model and making it much simpler and quicker to execute. And the fifth evolution was the one I started talking about earlier, this evolution in the service provider in the telco space. Traditional data centers for internal use being flipped around and suddenly being used to externally deliver video content services and applications. Let me give you a very quick picture as to why this is really important. Every morning, I have a three-year-old daughter. Uh, My principal job before leaving the house is to feed my daughter, because it's breakfast time. And as any good parent will tell you, the only way to actually feed a three-year-old is bribery. And her favorite bribe is a video. It happens to be a high-definition video. I pull off YouTube, lasts a minute or so. And while the video is playing, I can get the food into my daughter really quickly. The only problem is that I drive my network and service provider completely crazy because I do this at the breakfast table on my RIM BlackBerry. And about one minute after I've downloaded this high-definition video and showed it to her, I do it again. And I do it again. And I keep doing it about 25, 30 times every breakfast time. And you can imagine the implications for this network provider. This crazy guy somewhere in San Francisco is requesting a high-definition video all the way across my network, up into the internet, into somebody else's server, pulling down a high-definition stream, squeezing it across the network, squeezing it across the radio, and then showing it to his daughter. Now, actually, if you take the cloud model and say, let me put some of that content and video delivery into the data centers in the service provider, Let me put some small content delivery and video data centers at the edge of the network and actually apply some intelligence to that cloud delivery. I can identify that that video has just been used. I can identify that it's been delivered to a RIM BlackBerry and really only needs a screen this big and not this big. And I can make that decision as the request comes in. And I can hold the content right at the edge of the network and make it very easy to replicate that same request a whole bunch of times. You can save a lot of cost, a lot of capacity, a lot of the implications for video delivery and content. 
I talked very briefly about partnerships. We have partnerships with VMware, Cisco, EMC. We have partnerships with VMware, Cisco, NetApp. We actually have very broad partnerships. The solutions and the technologies I'm talking about will work with all of the leading suppliers in the data center and the cloud space. And I talked about our capacity to be able to design, architect, and implement this as a private enterprise or as a telco operator. I wanted to give you a little snapshot into the future, and I'll just take a couple more minutes of your time. Cisco also announced a real significant evolution uh, about three, four months ago. Within the internet operating system, iOS, the networking operating system, and within the data center elements that I touched on briefly, there are now increasingly capabilities to make the cloud more network aware and to make the network much more cloud aware. So the network can advertise, I have available capacity, I have available space. The data center can advertise that I have available capacity, I have available space. And in combination with service orchestration and the delivery platforms, you can now really take dynamic decisions to say, my data center in the UK is redlining. Overcapacity, too much demand, can't handle it. Let me look across the network and the other data centers and find out where I have spare capacity. And let me report that back up to the orchestration layer and let the orchestration layer make a connection between my empty data center somewhere in Scandinavia and my busy data center somewhere in the UK. And let me virtually move some of those images across, maybe the ones that are less time dependent or latency dependent, unload that data center in the UK and shift the capacity and really dynamically rebalance how the cloud is delivered. And I think going forwards, you'll see that this is the beginnings of truly dynamic clouds, the ability for data centers and networks to be aware of what they're being used for and how they're being used and literally be able to dynamically readjust based on expectation. I did mention at the beginning I'd give you one good compelling economic reason as to why virtualization and cloud services are really going to matter going forward and why people are changing. What I'm showing you here is a chart of the average cost for an IT department to deliver a enterprise IT service to a 60,000 employee company based somewhere in San Jose who you can probably guess who it is. And the height of the bars tells you for the legacy data center, the legacy IT implementation, that it used to cost $3,750 per quarter per operating system instance running in that virtualized data center, that virtualized cloud model. Just by virtualizing, going from the traditional server to the virtualized model, you can reduce that cost by 37%. Then, the move from the first bar to the second bar. Then, by putting automi automation and combining that compute, networking, and storage capabilities into a single integrated management framework, you can further reduce that cost by 16%. Then, by moving from that unified approach to a cloud-based, portfolio-based, menu-based web services-based interface, you can pull the cost down again by another 17%. And actually now, as an enterprise, when we specify new software or applications from suppliers, everything must be virtualizable. If it doesn't run in a virtualized data center, if it doesn't run in the cloud, we don't actually take that software or that application anymore. And by moving to that highly virtualized model, dynamic, self-service, and enabled, you can pull those costs down again by 24%. So if you're an enterprise running a data center and a set of IT services, and you shift to a virtualized cloud-based model, you go from $3,750 per server per instance down to in the order of $1,200 per server, almost a 75% reduction in costs, OPEX and CAPEX. 
And for me, that tells you what a compelling economic experience it is to shift to this virtualized world alongside all of the other benefits we talked about. So let me wrap up there, having run over a little bit. But I hope that gives you a flavor in terms of why we think this is fundamentally important, why it's changing the economics and the dynamics for people, and what it means going forwards is everything you see in the expo hall out there is just the beginning of a fundamental shift and change in the industry as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Simon Aspinall. Cisco, I believe lunch is served in about 10 minutes.